A warm welcome to your Barbados Today evening news update for Tuesday, February 15. Face to face classes in Barbados resume on a phased basis starting Monday, February 21. The confirmation came this evening from Education Minister Kay McConney as she assured that a roadmap which resulted from extensive consultation with a wide cross section of stakeholders is in place for the safe reopening of schools. She told a national news conference that while most parties were eager to return to physical classrooms, there's still lingering apprehension for some, and the ministry has implemented measures to address the concerns. Those educational partners who has, have indicated that you will not be able to start on February 21st for various reasons you've proffered, we have heard you. And those education partners who have indicated that you are ready and willing to try a start on February 21st. We too have heard you. We appreciate that some people are experiencing anxiety about returning to face-to-face -to -face school for various reasons equally legitimate for your circumstance. To support the former, that is to support those who are experiencing that anxiety the ministry has augmented our effort to strengthen the Student Support Services Unit. For example, we have engaged seven additional primary school social workers and seven counselors for secondary schools. These officers have started work with students and teachers at several schools to prepare them for the return to face-to-face -to -face classes. Chief Education Officer Dr. Ramona Archer Bradshaw outlined that the return to school will be done in two phases. In the first phase are students from nursery to reception at primary schools and fourth, fifth and sixth formers from secondary schools. The second phase includes classes one, two and three and at the secondary level, second and third form. Dr. Archer Bradshaw outlined the four main requirements for the safe reopening of schools. In terms of distancing, we are saying that all students in classrooms should be seated three feet apart. All students should follow the COVID-19 protocols and be three feet apart at all times. In terms of mask wearing, all students are required to wear masks at all times. Of course, allowances will be made for mask breaks. Sanitizing stations are also a requirement. And this is across all levels from nursery to secondary. We also want to conduct random testing for students and for staff across nursery, primary, and secondary schools. I must say at this time that the random testing will not occur during the first week or the second week. Uh, we are awaiting the swabs and as soon as we receive the swabs and training has taken place, the random testing will occur. For students, we require parental consent and the parental consent forms will be made available. The chief medical officer says the Ministry of Health is fully back in the return to classes next Monday. Dr. Kenneth Jar says once protocols are followed, major outbreaks are unlikely. I would like the public to know that transmission in schools is an unlikely event. Transmission is more likely to occur in your homes where people socialize and where people live. Based on the protocols, the Ministry of Health strongly believes that schools are relatively safe environments for learning. And once the protocols are adhered to, there shall be no mass spread of COVID or a micron for that matter, in schools. Prime Minister Mia Motley and the Presidents of Ghana, Barbados and Suriname today voiced their full support for striking the balance between tackling climate change and renewable energy. 
as they address the International Energy Conference and Expo that opened today in Georgetown. More from Newsroom Guyana. President Ali talked about how Guyana will pursue and ensure that it pays robust attention to how it utilizes the oil and gas resources uh, to enrich and bring benefits to all uh, citizens of the country. And he said that will be done uh, in a quick manner, but also bearing in mind the country's responsibility and commitment to the global causes of climate change, mitigating climate change, and also uh, bringing into focus renewable energy. Uh, he said that the government will not shy away from ensuring that Guyanese benefit at the same same time while it keeps those commitments at the same time from its oil and gas resource and the Prime Minister of Barbados Mia Motley also touched on that issue and congratulated Guyana for putting in place its local content policy and really saying you know citizens cannot remain tenants in their own country and the policies should be put in place to ensure that citizens benefit in that regard. Uh, four heads of state speaking this morning at the opening Dr. Ali uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados Mia Motley and we also had the president of Ghana, uh, really giving Ghana some advice on how it could continue to develop its oil and gas resources uh, sustainably and uh, that will benefit in the future. He spoke specifically also about local content, but in a 12-point uh, suggestion that he gave to the Ghana government, he talked against some issues, including flaring, and we'll take a look at this presentation, but also how countries can cooperate and come together um, to develop their oil and gas resources and also keep the responsibility, the global responsibility, to the causes that I mentioned before, uh, climate change and renewable energy. The president of Surrey and I'm speaking on that issue and just saying that Guyana will pool its resources with Suriname and with Brazil to ensure that they contribute to the regional future uh, in energy. We never had the capital or the resources to build the diversified economy that we're talking about. That is why Alex mentioned that we've always spoken about the promises and dreams and aspirations of generations of Guyanese. Today, with hard work, simplicity, and humility, we have the ability to make that giant leap, not only for Guyana, but for all of humanity, and we must do it. The day that we do not provide opportunity for our citizens who participate in active citizenship, of being able to benefit from the patrimony of our country, is the day we sow the seeds of destruction of our nation and invite. <laughs> and invite disruption. We will have difficult conversations as well in CARICOM, and we must. But those conversations recognize that in every country, there are even regional and local <laughs> conflicts and disagreements. And it is our duty to be able to smooth that over, but to ensure that at no stage as newly independent countries of the world do we leave our citizens as tenants in their own land, but make them owners of all that they must survey? In the latest COVID-19 update, a 67-year-old unvaccinated woman died from the virus today. Her death comes on the passing of two men, one who was 75 years old and unvaccinated, and the other an 84-year-old who was fully vaccinated on Monday. They all passed away at the Harrison's Point Isolation Facility, bringing the death toll to 303. Meanwhile, 415 new positive cases were confirmed from 1,844 tests conducted by the Besta Santos Public Health Laboratory on Monday. The positives consisted of 64 persons under the age of 18 and 351 who were 18 years and older. There were 138 people in isolation facilities, while 5,077 were in home isolation. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, I am Onika. I am a mother, I'm a daughter, and I'm a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, 
I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To regional news in Trinidad and Tobago, National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines is defending the government's decision to dismantle the Special Operations Response Team. He maintains the action was the decision of the acting police commissioner, MacDonald Jacob, and there was no political interference. We get the details from TDT News. Minister Hines stayed clear of questions from the opposition, saying there was no political interference in the decision and added that the police service is constantly engaged in observation and practice learning from international organizations. The announcement of the dismantling of SOT came earlier this week, and Mr. Jacobs said more will be revealed about the new unit, the National Operations Task Force, by month's end. Minister Hines, though, said the move was solely done by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. The Commission of Police exercising his authority under the law and under the Constitution makes these kinds of administrative changes as he see fit, sees fit on the basis of information coming to him, records that will be available to him, recent histories that will be available to him, and of course, influenced as well by international uh, policing organizations and elements that might provide support for the best practice in Trinidad and Tobago. On the international front, U.S. President Joe Biden made an impassioned plea to the Russian president to step back from war with Ukraine, speaking starkly of the needless death and destruction Moscow could cause and the international outrage Putin would face. If Russia does invade in the days and weeks ahead, the human cost for Ukraine will be immense. And the strategic cost for Russia will also be immense. If Russia attacks Ukraine, it will be met with overwhelming international condemnation. The world will not forget that Russia chose needless death and destruction. Invading Ukraine will prove to be a self-inflicted wound. The United States and our allies and partners will respond decisively. The West is united and galvanized. Today, our NATO allies and the alliance is as unified and determined as it has ever been. That's news, but for the very latest, visit our website at www.barbidistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook. And sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media and Bus Terminals, as well as Screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.